Hey sportsman, John Bergsman here with Captain Alex, our fishing report coordinator. We're here today kind of in that middle ground, Alex, where there's really no safe ice other than possibly way in the upper peninsula. And we don't want to hear at the Fisherman's Digest send people out to die. So we're going to talk about pre-ice fishing looking forward because I'm pretty sure, don't you agree, within a week or two we should be fishing. Correct. After tomorrow's really cold spell and then going into next week, I mean, it's going to be yeah, really we've close. Looked, we've looked forward pretty good and it, and it seems like we're, we've got ice fishing weather, especially for northern Michigan. And then if you stay with us past those looking forward ice fishing reports, you're going to get some really good usable tips. I know you're off the water. The salmon and trout guys are off the water. Now they're concentrating on river fishing. But this is the time, correct, Alex, where a lot of those guys will sit in their workshop and they'll get all of their tackle out, they'll clean it up, they'll re-rake for next spring, and Captain Alex is going to give you guys who are just getting into salmon and trout fishing on the big lake some really useful pointers on the where's, the when's, the why's of when you use spin doctors, action flies, meat rigs, you name it. Stay tuned. This will be a very informative session today. So hey guys, we're going to have a couple, actually three, forward-looking ice fishing reports. Now we're going to start with Lake Cadillac and Mitchell and the Cadillac region. And Captain Alex has spent a bunch of time on those lakes. We're going to talk about that looking forward because it could be, right Alex, as early as this coming weekend. If the weather holds up the way it looks, it, it could possibly be this weekend. Exactly. And then we're going to move on up north just a little bit and we're going to talk about that that Manistee area all the way up to Benzie County because there's a lot of lakes right in there. Portage Lake is kind of a tougher one because it's connected to the big lake. So sometimes it doesn't get early ice, but Bear Lake for sure will be one that'll ice up first. And then we're gonna cross the bridge and we're gonna talk about early ice way in the western upper peninsula of Michigan, Lake Gogebic. That we know already has safe ice, our friend Don Gerbovich who has been a fishing reporter all season long for, for us, done a great job. I noticed he had a Facebook post with him and his dog sitting in his shanty and two walleyes on the ice. So, Donnie, we're watching you. Stay tuned. Those three ice fishing uh, forward-looking reports, as well as Cat Alex is an avid ice fisherman. We're going to talk about some basic setups if you're looking into getting ice fishing. So start right now with Cadillac and Mitchell. Cadillac and Mitchell, it's a simple setup. If people want to take shanties out or just sit on a bucket on the ice like the old timers like to, all you need is an ultralight rod and a little jig. Tungsten is the way to go. Now, when you're, when you're rigging this, give some people some backbone. You're using a braid to floral, right? Yep, I'm using a six pound braid to about a six pound floral. Okay. Uh, depending on what lake you're fishing, how clear it is, that's the biggest teller of what kind of line you should be using. Exactly, and a standard 28, this looks like a 28 or 30 inch rod, really soft tip is important, correct? Yes, yeah, so you gotta be able to feel the bites, especially if you're just sitting outside, the wind can play a big factor in that. Yeah, and fish, you gotta remember too guys, fish are not as aggressive in the winter, so they'll slide up and sometimes stare at, I've looked at them through the camera, stare at your bait, for what seems like an eternity and then they'll run up and just mouth it not even really go anywhere with it and these super sensitive tips correct alex yes will transmit that little bend to you and let you know to go ahead and set correct now talk about that bait too because that thing thing looks too doinky to even tie on to something but that's really standard isn't it yeah it is uh this would actually in my opinion would be on the bigger side for bluegill exactly uh, about perfect size for crappie when you're running these jigs i know it's hard to see there's a little knot that you're tying on and you really want it to sit horizontal like that. So it's good. the knot itself is holding the hook and the jig the way you want to Correct. push it. Correct. Now what are you tipping yours with when you're on Cadillac and Mitchell and, and Misaki and you're fishing for what? Crappie, bluegill, and, and, and uh, just panfish. Yeah, um, typically you're gonna go with your mousies. Uh, I tip mine with mousies, two of them. One is just not enough, two it seems just right. And then uh, a lot of people's favorite is wax worms as well. Sure, exactly. Now talk to us there about um, the technique for bluegill because a lot of people will dead stick one rod, right? Yeah, um, a lot of people will use slip bobbers as well. Um, as their dead stick. As their dead stick, just so they're not having to watch two rod sure. sets at the same time. Gives you time. forgiveness. It slowly goes down. You've Absolutely. got time to set your jig and rod down and go. So 
There's your tip right there. We'll talk a little bit later in the season about the great pike fishing that goes on, but we'll save that for the next issue. And uh, hey, next up, Manistee County and the lakes in Manistee County. Stay tuned. And hey, thanks so much, Pilgrim's Village. Before we check out, Pilgrim's Village, because what's the most important thing about early ice, Alex? Safety. Correct. Safety, having your ice picks, having flotation devices, a having rope. ropes, and always go with a friend. For Just sure. don't tell somebody, go with someone. That's right. And so when you're in that Cadillac region and you're looking for a great place to stay, right down the shore from Pilgrim's Village, uh, where you're going to get your safe ice report, and you're going to get your mousies and your wax worm, the days in and Cadillac, right down the street, great accommodations. Of course, the Pilgrim's Village itself is a resort right on the lake side of Mitchell and they've got cabins there if you talk to Chris or Steve and get yourself booked up there. The Cadillac region is awesome place to go right now and going forward probably until March. So remember call Pilgrim's Village for a safe ice report. I don't want to read about you in the newspaper. Just a quick ditty here from WavePro about one of the top reasons you should buy a WavePro and have these in your boat. Lee, talk to me about that forgiveness factor of the air and oil combination within the shop. Yeah, the air is really forgiving. You can have a 300 pound guy sit in it, you can have a 100 pound person and it's always going to do its thing because the hydraulic oil part is always working. I mean, there's exactly. This so it's compression, basically. It's you're compression. Using, you're we're, using the principles of compression and continuing compression. And we're squishing that air right to nothing, and it's just spiking up because basically we're running out of place to squish the air. Exactly. And, uh, where if it was the spring, it was goes 100, 200, 300 per exactly. inch, where we're 100... 300, 900, 1800. Exactly. So. And so that's why when I'm feeling that, when I'm running rough waffle or chop, which is always the worst, you know, I'm seeing the seat base, it's just constantly adjusting just as fast as I'm hitting that chop, that seat base is adjusting. And my body essentially is staying pretty much in the same place. It's just yeah. adjusting for it. Yeah, we had Fox on Mille Lacs here and uh, these things move like 60 inches a second. <laughs> That's how much movement capability, and the key is the air, because we're just squishing it to nothing, so basically we're airlocking you. That's what's keeping you from bottoming, but we are slowing you with the oil up and down to control so it isn't trying to shoot you out of the chair. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, hey, just another reason to buy a Wave Pro seat base for your next boat, or if you're sick of getting your back beat up, how about retrofitting your current boat with a set of new Wave Pros? Hey, now back to the fishing reports. So, next up, Alex, we're going to talk about your favorite place, and that is the area around the Manistee region. Now, Manistee is one of those early ice areas on the inner lakes. Not so much uh, Portage. Portage, because of that flow from the channel, can, can sometimes be a little bit behind. But talk about the lakes that do freeze up relatively quickly and what the opportunities are. Uh, one of my favorite lakes that freezes up fairly quickly on the north end is Hamlin Lake. That's everyone's favorite bluegill lake, oh, it is. and it's phenomenal, even if you're going out to chase pike. Uh, it's shallow water in the north end, and it freezes up very quickly. So you grab this tip up because we're going to have you talk about that. And one of the things we touched on at the Cadillac Report, of course, this bluegill rod is going to come in very, very handy on an all-day basis at Hamlin. But talk to us about this walleye and perch set up with your tip up because a lot of people while well, Alex is unwrapping this a lot of people use a tip up for pike fishing but to be honest the more I talk to experienced ice fishermen they're using these tip ups to catch big perch walleye and even large panfish yeah correct uh, this is just a simple dog bone fray bill I you know they're not expensive right. uh, easy I to use yep I have 30 pound mono on here a lot of people like using the actual ice line the mono's fine as long as you don't let it freeze. Uh, and then I go from a swivel, barrel swivel, to about a, again, six pound fluoro with just a tiny treble hook. That looks like about a number 10 or 12 for the guys that are looking. Correct. And what are you tipping that with? Uh, let's say you're gonna go perch fishing. Are you are you pick, tipping this with a small small perch minnow? Yeah, small perch minnow. Um, and but if you're on a bigger body of water, like I said, like we talked about portage, 
you can use blues out there as well. Okay, so you can use the bigger blues. Yes. Now the cool thing about the bigger blues is you're gonna also get, you know, your random walleye coming through. They're gonna be really willing to take that. You could even lose a rig or two to an aggressive norther. Now one of the keys to this and to any tip up fishing, as Alex is gonna take a second to explain is, you always see those funky little clip things hanging on ice fishermen's check, their zippers or something. It's an ice weight. You clip it on the bottom of this treble hook and again, we're talking to, to newer ice fishermen now, and you're gonna use that to drop it down and establish what bottom is, and mark that bottom, whether it's with a marker or something where you reel that up to it. Now, Alex, why is setting the depth so important? If there's a weed line, or if you're on the weeds, you wanna be above it where the fish can see it. Exactly. Again, fish, we are told growing up, fish always feed up. That's not always true, but the bigger fish are always more aggressive and always gonna be up towards that top, topper part of the water column. Exactly, so if you're in a 10 foot water, and let's say we're outside, we're gonna paint a hypothetical for you to help you out. So a lot of guys early season will fish structural points, almost the same thing they'd fish at the end when it was still open water. Whether it's a rock point or a sand to gravel break edge, or, or a little weeds that goes to more open, open water and not so many weeds, if we're in 10 foot of water, what would you say is a good starting point to set that down? Nine, but eight and a half? Nine foot would be where I would start. Right, so a foot off the bottom. And what that's doing is allowing marauding fish that are cruising to be able to see that up in front of them, correct? correct. Now, when you run this also, I got to imagine you're going to put a pretty decent sized split shot somewhere on it to keep yep. that minnow pegged down. Yeah, correct? typically I let that minnow swim. Like here, yep, is about a foot. So I'll put a split shot right above that barrel swivel. Exactly. So again, guys, you're crimping that split shot on the heavier line or the braid, whichever you choose to go with, and using that barrel swivel so that it won't go any deeper than that. Correct. And that's why it's so important to set your line from the hook because not from this barrel swivel because, again, this is going to hang down a good foot and that'll mess you up. So the principles of tip-up is basically... Fish the size of hook and the size of minnow to the to what you're fishing for. Absolutely. If you were going to go pike fishing as a target, that'd probably be a number six trouble. Correct? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And a bigger minnow. Correct. Or or sucker chuck. Set your depth before you start. And the cool thing about tip ups is, again, we've talked about the safety element of this, is going with two or three or four guys is not only much safer if somebody does run into trouble, but you can spread eight of these out and cover a whole weed line and zero in on the fish much quicker. Absolutely, um, another big thing that we need to talk about is get your Garmin out there. If you have one in your boat and you're marking spots, bring it with you ice fishing. Those fish are gonna sit there till first ice. Just because there's ice on the water doesn't mean they're gone. Listen, there's a, I'm gonna talk about that right now. You see this right here. This to me is almost cheating, but of course there is no such thing as cheating with electronics. It's just good for you. So Panoptics Live Scope. Garmin's got a brand new ice fishing bundle created and packaged and put together that you can order the whole bundle. Comes with a rod that you can stick down in the water. And for those of you that haven't used it, what it really does is give you live scope technology on a 360 turnable transducer to your unit. So that used to be the old days, we run out there, we drill a pilot hole, right? And then we put our transducer, a down transducer in it, go, are there fish or are there not? If there wasn't, you'd just start what? Running around drilling yep. 30, 40 holes. Hop and hold the hole. Now you go to a primary area that's been good in the past. You drill one hole, you drop your live scope down. There's a little arrow on the top of it that shows you which way the transducer's pointing. So now you can very slowly turn it and it will show you swimming fish and it'll tell you how far out. There's a grid that shows you 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So you can literally say, oh, 40 feet out this direction, there's a nice school of something. And you can slowly with one hole identify those critical areas and you can get real close just by taking, you know, paces. 20 foot is what, six or seven good strides. Absolutely. And then you can drill a couple holes there. Garmin Live Scope in an ice fishing bundle is the hottest thing. They just had it at the DNR show. I just called the guy from DNR Sports yesterday. They sold out of them. It's unbelievable. It is the best technology for making ice, fishable more, ice fishing more effective. Check it out online. Check it out with major tackle retailers. Ask them for the Panoptics Live Scope ice fishing bundle. Hey, we'll be right back with 
Western Upper Peninsula and Lake Ogebic. Hey guys, you know what? It's almost boat show season. That's right, the ultimate fishing show is just around the corner. You gotta get down to Wilson Marine. Here are one of their four locations in Southeast Michigan. Angler Quest, Starcraft, Crestliner, your fishing boat headquarters has got 2019 non-currents at blowout prices. Check in with one of the salespeople, make your best deal, They'll wrap that boat up for you, put it away for the rest of the winter, and walleye fishing starts in March or April on the rivers, you'll be ready to go. Get on down to Wilson's and make your best deal. Why mess around with a boat show scene? Get it done right now at Wilson's Marine. So guys, we're back. Last report of the day, looking forward again now, but this one's actually happening, and that's Don Gerbovich from up in the up in the greater Gogebic area, who's an aggressive fisherman, loves to fish with his buddy. He's, he's not a guide, he's just a great guy who and his, he and his friends keep us updated on what's going on. And word has it that in the western UP, there's, there's pretty good safe ice on Gogebic, and that the walleyes and the perch, the perch not so much, but more walleyes are starting to bite pretty good. Take us through that walleye setup. This is a standard setup for walleye guys, correct? Correct. If you're in the UP on Beta Knock, Inland Lakes, or Saginaw Bay, this is a UP made bait and it's a dew jigger. Uh, they come in multiple sizes and again, you're going to be fishing with braid for subtle bites and you're going to have your floor covering. Your... So the same basic concept all the way through is a very light braid to a, to a light floor. Yep, this is about an eight pound. And just because you're walleye fishing, you're beefing it up from the four to six that you would use for small. Yeah, because they're not always coming in and pecking at it like a bluegill yeah, they're would. Gonna they're going to swipe at it. Uh, you're going to be using a medium rod. Uh, this is a 24 inch. Um, a lot of backbone. Again, a subtle tip, but you want to be able to feel that bite. Exactly. And again, same thing, uh, same idea there. You're going to drop that to the bottom. You're going to maybe reel it up three, four inches, and you're going to and you're going to jig it. And also, one of the critical things I've heard is that pounding the bottom, dropping it all the way to the bottom. Talk to us about that fish curiosity and why that's such a big deal. Yeah, if you have a sandy or rocky bottom, pounding it on the spot like that, almost jigging reverse, hitting, those, jigging. Yep, oh. hitting those rocks and kicking up some of that sand just gives, brings so much curiosity to those fish. And it, when they, you lift it up and all they see is a minnow, I mean, they're gonna hit it. Exactly, so uh, same concept that we've talked to uh, you about our down jigging process where at rest you're about three four or five inches off the bottom and you're actually just dropping quickly the bait to let it impact the bottom the same as we would in the river scenario of down jigging and then popping it right back up it's that noise it's the silt poof whatever it is and then immediately after that noise or silt poof boom there's the minnow sitting right above that silt or that noise and the, and the curious fish come in and obviously they're staring right at the bait you want them to hit. So remember that, same thing uh, is in reverse that down jigging versus up jigging. Up jigging simply makes it very hard for those lethargic winter fish to chase it and find it. Yep. You're, you're really resting it. When you, when you do hit and you come back up, you're doing very little with it other than just dead stick holding it. Right? Yeah, you're coming right back to your starting point and just lifting and holding. And again, electronics. What have you found? Have you found that, that that's when most of the hits occur when you're just dead stick holding it and they just load it up? Yep. Uh, inland lakes uh, typically is when you come up, but when you're fishing the Great Lakes walleye, they seem a little more aggressive. And it's when you when it hits the bottom, they're pinning it to the bottom. When exactly. you lift, so they're there. And when you lift, lift they're already, they're already there. Hooked. So then just keep it going. Yep. Yep. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're looking for some awesome fishing, Lake Gogebic from now until April probably because it just gets worse and worse up there weather-wise is an awesome place. Now if you're looking for great accommodations up in the Gogebic region, you're going to want to check in with our friends up at Timbers Resort. Now Tim and Sarah can put you not only in a cozy warm cabin, which boy you got to have, and put you right in the middle of a little town that's got some really nice restaurants to eat both breakfast, lunch, and dinner at, but they can also give you great tips. Tim's an, a guide on the lake. He can put you close to where the fishing is happening. And they've also got a cool little bait store right there on site. That's one of the huge advantages when you stay at Timbers is that you've got that bait store with bait and minnows and ta tactics and a guide sitting right there helping you get started. So hey, 
Check out the Western Upper Peninsula and Lake Gogebic this year. Make a reservation. Get up there. Experience the great fishing. And as always, we'll see you next week right here on the Fisherman's Digest Fishing Report. If you're looking for a great, affordable outbuilding for whatever your needs is, check out my friends at Midwest Steel Carports up in Grant, Michigan. They have awesome outbuildings at affordable prices with quality craftsmanship. That's Midwest Steel Carports up in Grant. Check them out online. So guys, in this segment, Alex and I are gonna have kind of a back and forth conversation. Many of you know I was a past tournament walleye fisherman. And so when I got into silverfish fishing, Alex, cause I live right here in Grand Rapids, which is, you know, really close to a lot of awesome fishing. I was completely in the dark, point blank. I have no idea or had no idea what to buy, how to use it if I bought it, or what. So one of the most intimidating things when I got in the boat that first time fishing was everyone talked about this Dreamweaver Spin Doctor. Now this to me, when I just physically look at it as a non-salmon guy, it's super intimidating. Number one, how do I hook it up? Number two, um, when do I use it? Where can I use it? What application should I not use it in? And uh, then also what baits are a natural to hook to the back of it is that fish catching point of contact. So I got one rigged up behind you, Alex, if you want to grab it. Uh, and just talk to me, I'll hold the spin, I'll hold the, the spin doctor part and, and talk us through, oh, starting with what is the purpose of this? When we start talking about spin doctors from Dreamweaver, we're talking about attracting fish in deeper water. Typically you're gonna run them anything from 50 feet out to anywhere out to 600 foot of water, 900 foot of water, but only about 100, 120 down. In that 30 foot of water, you really just don't need it to attract those fish. Because of light penetration. Right? Correct. They can see your spoon flashing. Correct. So this is an, actually nothing more than a rotating attractor. Yep, it makes anywhere on the settings, anywhere from you know, two foot to five foot circles in the water. So you can adjust the circles, that's cool. I noticed also Dreamweaver's got just a, a, a number of different flash tapes and different attractant colors built into these. Um, and so you've got just any, you know, Captain Chuck's as an example up in Ludington or the outdoorsman here in, in Jenison, my hometown, has got sometimes a display of, of multiple sizes and 30 different colors of these things. And so a guy can go nuts there. So this is a rotating attractor. Now, what do you, what do you hook to the end of it? You can tie anything, starting with a swivel, go anywhere from an action fly to even a meat rig. Again, Dreamweaver makes them, Captain Chuck's has them, Tangle Tackle has them. Any big lake bait store is gonna have them. And then after that, I mean, it's really anywhere from a 20 to a 42 inch lead sometimes, depending on if the fish are more stagnant, if they're more active, it's gonna depend on what lead you go with. Exactly, but right out of the box, you can get action flies that come with probably a pretty standardized lead, so a guy has a good starting point. Correct? Yep, uh, your standard leads, um, obviously you can retie, but their standard leads, again, come from about 36 inches. So talk to me about the, the rod setups, okay? In most salmon fish spreads, now that I have actually done it enough time, you're gonna have board rods that are gonna have uh, short to long coppers, correct? Correct. From let's say 100 all the way out to 450 is the most I've used. And then you're gonna have your wire diver rods, which we have here, a high and a low diver rod, which are our wire rig and your down riggers. Which of those rods would you say can handle a spin doctor and or better yet, which would rods would you not put a spin doctor on because it's simply too aggressive? Uh, you know, when you're starting out, you really want to focus on putting them on downriggers right away. Okay. Start with one downrigger and then both divers. When I run charters and I know a lot of other experienced fishermen run, they run with divers and then they start going to their lead cores and their coppers. But the rods I would stay away from using would be your one to six color lead cores or your 100 
uh, to one one fifties. I would stay away from on counters. And that's basically just because there's not enough depth acquired and not enough weight and bulk there to kind of handle what this thing's going to do. Yeah, that'll right. really start to pull up on that line and float it up a little right. bit more. And it'll give out of the you range. a false sense of where that's actually going. Correct. In the column is the biggest reason. So. So basically, a, a, a 200 copper, three, 200 to 450 copper, a wire diver rod or a downrigger rod, all of those, this is a good application yes. for this attractor. Correct. Okay, now we talked just briefly about that action fly. What are you fishing for when you run an action fly? So a guy goes out there, he, gets, he understands the concept of what he can and can't run them on. What are you fishing for and why do you choose? When's a fly the right choice? When I'm using flies, I'm using them early season from that May all the way to the beginning of August. Um, the meat bite can be good, but I typically see the fly action flies being the best at that time frame. And the water's a little warm, and you're trying to get those fish really active and going is after there a something. Specific, is there a specific fish that loves flies? Like I've noticed that, that I've caught a, an inordinate number of coho on the mid to higher rods when I've been pulling a fly. Yep, the smaller in length of the tinsel on the fly will really attract those cohos. King salmon, love them, oh, yeah. all the way from juvenile to adults, yep. and those steelhead when you're fishing offshore. Exactly, but I've noticed for me personally, 200 to 300 coppers and a high diver, I've done really, really well on flies and coho. Now that could be just because that's the range and the zone that coho like, but uh, okay, so we've got a spin doctor and a fly. So talk to me, when does a guy go to a meat rig? Now this is a, this is a, a Dreamweaver meat rig uh, and it comes all pre-packaged. They're really cool, Alex, because they're all rigged. A guy doesn't need to do anything but open the package. And Shane and the boys at Dreamweaver actually have the meat inserts for these as well, don't they? Yeah, they actually carry their own cut bait, so it's pretty exactly. great. Exactly, so you can go to any major Dreamweaver supplier like you know, we've mentioned Tangled Tackle, Captain Chuck's, all these lake store uh, bait shops are going to carry that meat rig meat and it's designed to go right in there. And then what, explain it, it's, you peg it with a toothpick, Yep, right? and then the packs even come with a toothpick. Um, I always advise people to go buy more because this one's just not going to last. Um, you put it in through one of the two holes here and break it off or cut it off. So you poke it all the way through and then just snap, snap the it off. off. Yep. Okay. And that plastic makes it a real simple, clean break. And then you run that behind the spin doctor much the same way as you would attach and run yeah, the Yeah, it's typically the same length besides you have three teasers before your meat head. Okay. And they're always hitting that back one if it imitates. And that's a, what these things in the package are? Yep. And if they're the meat head right here is imitating a wounded fish or bait fish and it spins like it's wounded sure. and struggling. Now, give, give, give the listeners some tips. When would you say, or what application? Do you use meat rigs on anything you would use a spin doctor on, or do you find them to work better like on riggers or divers or something? Uh, I would run them behind a spin doctor all the time. Yep. Uh, your 10 inch, your eight inch, yep. and even the big foots now. And again, just run them mainly off riggers and low divers would You're be the best. You're targeting kings with this bait, are Correct. you Correct, this is, you will catch lake trout and steelhead every sure. now and then, but your main target is adult kings when you're running this so stuff. So that's kind of an indicator as to which rods to, to run them on as well, correct? Because not all your rods are gonna be in a primary king zone. Correct. So, so to me, that's speaking to me as divers and riggers is what I would probably think in my limited knowledge of silverfish fishing, is that correct? Absolutely. Yep, so now give us some tips about speed. Are these, are these anything you need to slow down for? Or will these run just fine right at the 2.3 to 2.7 that most you know, king guys are fishing? The speed's gonna more depend on the spin doctors themselves. They like to be ran from about 1.9 to 2.5 at the most, sure. but typically that 2.3 range is the best. Yeah, exactly, and that's why I started with 2.3. The few guys I've gone with, uh, Mark Rapson from Black Pearl, I mean, ridiculously good fishermen down south in here in Holland and south, and you and the boys up in Manistee and the guys that are on the other side of the lake and uh, uh, Gene Curvin over in the Taos region, they always are telling me, John, 2.3 to 2.5, if you had to pick a two-tenths mile an hour range to run, that's the two tenths. Do you agree with That's that? That's a great starting point for sure. Exactly. Now you can beef it up and you can do other things, but stay with us here on the Fisherman's Digest.
Because like we said, we're not just going to be giving fishing reports. We want to try to educate people to transition from walleye fishing to silverfish fishing. And also those guys who are primarily salmon fishing, you're missing some great walleye fishing if that's all you do, correct? Correct. Right. Be a multi-species guy. Hey, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a second. Hey, thanks for joining us today on this Hot Bites Fishing Report. You know, we're a little bit abbreviated because we're just like waiting for ice fishing to happen, but it's going to happen any day now. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you again next week on the Hot Bites Fishing Report.